If instead, Mr. Harville had like turned the lights off in the room on the first day, and then like put a flashlight in his face, and he was like, murder created the world you're in! I would have been like, what? And I would have really been engaged with American history, because the actual history of America is bonkers. There's a theatrical buzz going on around town. Why? Master storyteller Mike Daisy has returned to Seattle with his new show, A People's History. And joining me is the master himself, Mr. Daisy. So nice to see you. It's nice to be seen. Well, welcome back to Seattle. Now, before we launch into the new show, um, I wanted to give our viewers just a little context of kind of who you are, because you've got a big reputation. Uh, and you, your career kind of began in Seattle. Mm -hmm. 2001 was 21 dog years, right? Yes. And that was about your time at Amazon? Yes. Okay. And that was that kind of the leaping off point for you where you realized this is what I want to do? Yes, it really was. Yeah. Um, I'd uh, always wanted to work in the theater and mm -hmm. I'd always been very interested in writing and I wanted to find a way to uh, create a form where those things could could live together on stage and that's where it really started with, with that show. And so since that point you've written I think it's close to 30 monologues and plays you've performed around the globe, which brings us to this table and the new show, um, A People's History. So what is this new show about? Well, big question. Because it is a big question. Yeah. But, uh, fundamentally, this show is about uh, American history. Mm -hmm. And it's about all of American history, mm -hmm. which is a large topic. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to pick where to begin and end. So this is a show where I start in October on a, on a, on a crisp day in 1492 and I go all the way to 2018, huh. the present moment. Mm -hmm. So because of that, instead of trying to do all of that in like 90 minutes yeah. and then we get a coffee, which if I could pull that off, I totally would. Yeah. There's so much story to tell that it's in 18 parts. There are 18 chapters. Right. And so the whole show is actually about 30 hours long. But if you come to see it, yeah. It's about 90 minutes long, because you'll see one part of our entire American history. And, and so, and how did you, well, I want to talk about the monologues, but how did you start this? What was the, you put a couple things together to even start writing this piece, which was, I believe, your, your high school or uh, history book? Yeah, yeah, I read a bunch of things, but the, the show is made out of two books. Mm -hmm. And one book is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, mm -hmm. which is a history book that's kind of like uh, the inverse negative of a normal history book in that it focuses on all the people mm -hmm. in history that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So it focuses on the poor, women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ people, all these uh, groups that traditionally when we tell American history, we focus very specifically on people who look pretty much like me, right. you know, right, straight right. white men. Right. And so uh, what I was really interested in is how Zinn shows the same history, but how many things we've, we've left out and not illuminated. And then the book I put next to it, which made a lot of sense, is I went on eBay mm -hmm. and I found my actual US history book that I was taught US history from when I was in high school in rural Maine yeah. uh, a long time ago. And so that becomes the other book yeah. that I'm comparing what they both say about what history is. These two continents were incredibly full of people. They were not vast, open, unexplored spaces that you know, had nothing in them. The only way you could imagine that is if you were like, I want to take these spaces, and it's awkward if there are people here. <laughs> so if I'm gonna write about it so other people read it, maybe I could write about it where I just kind of erase them so they're not there. So you get like a great mythology of like the boundless, endless vistas of the West. Oh, there's something race though. Yeah, get those people out of there. And then it's nice and empty. So then, you know, white people can just like go there. When you were going through all this material, did you, what did you learn about U.S. history that you had no idea? Is there anything that really like, wow, that, that's something I didn't, I didn't know? Oh, so many things. Some of them because they're so, they're so small and clear and chilling. And some of them, uh, because myth, the mythology of them mm. has been changed to the opposite direction. Like the best short example would be that 
we talk about George Washington as the father of our country, right. uh, which is true, he was the first president. And then we talk about him as being uh, always, never telling a lie, mm -hmm. which uh, is actually kind of true mm -hmm. in that he was not a very clever, he was not known for his like verbal acuity. Uh -huh. So he may have never told a lie because he's kind of always very straightforward. And um, he also had wooden teeth, mm -hmm. is what we're taught. I know all those things. <clears throat> right, uh, except that they weren't wooden teeth. Uh -huh. And that's not a secret history. We knew the whole time uh -huh. because we had letters from him to his dentists. And we actually have his dentures that what he actually wore were dentures made out of his slaves' teeth, which he had extracted from his slaves' mouths while they were alive, made into dentures, and wore them in his mouth. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh my God, that's stunning. Mm -hmm. So there's more of that. Yes. Uh, eventually, through incredible, hard, difficult, vicious effort, um, black Americans finally made their way into upper education. And some of them actually chose for reasons that can't even, but why would they do this? Some of them finally were driven and compelled to become historians, and then they went into the same rooms that their white brethren had been going into for centuries, and they looked at the books and they said, wait a minute, we should tell this story. And you can imagine how much pushback there was. There was a lot. Um, so I just want to mention, because I'm curious on, on how, how this has gone for you since that controversy in 2010 with the Steve Jobs Apple thing. That was about artistic license as a storyteller, right, and journalistic, being a journalist factual. Um, mm -hmm. right? So how did you weather that controversy? Because I think you handled it well. And how did it, or did it, affect how you've gone forward and how you have written your work? Well, it affects everything in the sense that it becomes part of the matrix of, of things that everybody talks about. Right. Like, right. like, it affects your life because it becomes part of the story of, of who you are and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, it's been so many years now, but now as we sit in 2018, you know, we fight about what the nature of truth is constantly. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a very important role to be a monologist who's been through the fire of those kind of controversies to say that, no, no, there is something called the facts and those are vitally, utterly important. There's also the truth. And the truth is built out of which facts you accept and like what story you're choosing to tell. In a lot of ways, this narrative of this whole history mm -hmm. is a way of showing that we are all taught all these facts and many of the facts we're taught in school are completely true. Mm -hmm. They're just not every fact. And all the facts about women, George Washington's teeth, all these resonant details are left out. Right. So then we paint a certain picture. Mm -hmm. And you need to like look for those complexities mm -hmm. or you're never actually going to be able to, um, to create a society where we can actually have a real dialogue. Mm -hmm. What would you hope the audience takes away from your uh, people's history? I would hope that it engenders conversations where it's sort of wakes them up mm -hmm. and it makes them consider. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of people there. There's uh, uh, two people, I met them in the lobby, the uh, uh, older, older uh, white lady and a slightly younger uh, black woman who have met at the shows and yeah. they started coming. And because the show is in these many parts, they come repeatedly. Oh, wow. And so they were like, we're friends now, they told me. We've been coming, we've come like four or five of them. And uh, I took a picture of them in the lobby. They're very, they're very happy. And I was outside, I was waiting for, my, for a car to come and they were next to me. And I've just done all these shows and they've watched me for all these hours. Yes. They had nothing to say to me because <laughs> they were busy talking to each other about the nature of gentrification in Seattle, which I hadn't been talking about, but connects into all these labor things yeah. I've been discussing. And they got so excited and the car pulled up and I'm getting in and one of them said, we, we just ignored you. We were so busy talking about like, what does it mean to be in Seattle and the things that are changing? Yeah. And I was like, that's perfect. Perfect. That's exactly <laughs> right. You made my night. Take Good care. Night. Good oh. night. And so, yeah, it's, it's nice. Like that's the kind of thing yeah, you're hoping for. Yeah, right. Well, I'm so happy that you're back in Seattle and you're, you are truly a masterful uh, storyteller. Uh, a People's History written and performed by Mike Daisy runs now through November 25th in the Leo K Theater at Seattle Rep. And like we've been saying, 18 monologues, you come a lot of different nights, you're gonna see different things, so get your tickets. Thank you so much. Thank you what? for having me. Yeah, them. absolutely delightful. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. To the brain. Oh. To the brain. To the brain. To the and brain. the heart. And the heart. Mm-hmm.